my research question is uh, try to understand what hydrogen, uh, when it goes into a material, why it affects its properties so much. Hydrogen penetrating inside structural materials has been held responsible for catastrophes that you've all heard of, from the Fukushima accident to, for example, the old spillage in the Gulf of Mexico 10 years ago. We know it happens, we know hydrogen goes into materials and causes mayhem. It's been known for probably 200 years, but how it does it and how it affects the properties of the material so much is still a question that is begs for an answer. It's really difficult to go down to measuring individual atoms of hydrogen inside of a material because hydrogen is it's very light, it's very small, it moves a lot, very fast. There's hydrogen everywhere, it's the most abundant element in the universe. We really want to go down to measuring very small amounts of hydrogen inside a, a piece of, of material, an alloy, a metallic alloy. When we think of metals, we often think of a big block, right? But this block is actually made of a lot of small bricks, a bit like you could think of Legos, for example. And every Lego brick is of a different color that might reflect its local composition with, you know, for example, in a steel, some iron, some carbon, getting together and arranging themselves on a, in a very specific way, on a crystal lattice, as we say. And then the carbon sits around the iron in there and provides completely different properties locally to the material. And now we have these you know, two friends of iron and carbon and hydrogen comes in. What does it do? We don't know exactly where the hydrogen will be in the, in the structure. What we know is that on a micro scale, it will tend to make the material much more brittle. So if I start pulling on a piece of steel after I've loaded it with hydrogen, it will break very quickly. We want to understand this and we need to understand this. The approach that we are taking to do this is to find a way to freeze the material in the state where hydrogen is inside of the material so we can actually go down to precisely measuring where it is. What we have been developing here is built uh, on, a, on an existing technology but is a way to take a piece of material and freeze it to about minus 200 degrees. What happens then is that um, the atoms won't be moving anymore. And out of this, we then shape a specimen specifically for a technique called atom probe tomography. So in atom probe tomography, what do, do we do? We, we have a specimen that is shaped as a very sharp needle, and we apply a high voltage to this of a few kilovolts. And what this does is basically pull the electrons down a little bit, exposing the atoms on the surface, and to an extent that the atoms can start to fly, one after the other, away from this specimen. And then we collect these atoms that have transitions into ions on a particle detector and we measure the time it takes them to fly from the specimen to the detector. And why does it matter? It matters because a heavy atom will travel slowly, so it will take it a long time to reach the detector. However, a very light atom, like hydrogen for example, will travel very quickly. So based on the time of flight, we can actually determine which is the element that was sitting at that specific position on the specimen. So we collect these atoms, one after the other, after the other, a bit like we are peeling an onion, and we collect all of this data, and then we use a very uh, powerful computer to reconstruct every atom at its original position. So I'll be able to see, if I get back to my example of a piece of steel, whether I have a region locally that has, for example, more carbon or more iron, and I can position these hydrogen atoms inside of this volume. And these insights will help me understand how hydrogen um, behaves inside of the material. The first key finding is that by trialing several routes between getting a material and making a, a specimen and analyzing it, we could actually find the best way to freeze the hydrogen in position and then find the right conditions to get the optimal um, uh, measurements in terms of precision of the amount of hydrogen that we can detect. This has taken um, a significant amount of time, but we could finally prove that we could do it. So we can go down to measuring individual atoms of hydrogen inside of the material.
from a, a material standpoint, where the, the material we had selected is, um, is very resistant to halogen embrittlement, and we wanted to know precisely where the halogen was sitting inside of this, this structure. Again, I was saying you have this um, hierarchy of different sections with atoms arranged in one way and another way, with, for example, carbon-rich regions and ion-rich regions. And so one of the key findings that we had was that halogen tends to sit inside of these uh, carbon-rich regions and also sometimes at the interface between the matrix full of iron and these carbon-rich regions, these carbides, that typically strengthen the material. So you could ask why, why is it important that we could detect this halogen and measure it and quantita quantitatively go down to measuring individual atoms like this. And it is relevant because ultimately the problem of halogen inside of these materials is when it's free to roam around. And if it is, then it might actually inter interfere with the way the material deforms and accelerate it. So accelerating the failure of these materials. But what we've shown is that by putting some of these particles inside of the steel, these particles can trap the halogen, locating it in a specific phase, preventing it from going around and causing mayhem. So we need to now take these findings and we can move backwards one step and say, OK, how can we introduce some more of these particles inside of the material initially to make it more um, resistant against the embrittlement that is associated to the presence of halogen. We have now um, a number of different projects that exploit some of the knowledge that we've gained from this preliminary work and try to use this to make steels that are better and stronger against halogen embrittlement. But not only are they better against halogen embrittlement, we also want to make them usable. So we want to not you know, introduce elements that cost a a lot of money because then it means that the impact of these new alloys will be probably minimal because the industry will never adopt them. We want to be able to use elements that are traditionally used in, in, in the industry so we can actually make materials that are relatively cheap and yet that actually will be um, very good against halogen embrittlement. Also, halogen embrittlement doesn't only affect steel, it also affects titanium alloys, for example, that go into planes. It affects nickel alloys that are used in, to drill holes to look for oil and gas, for example, which might still not be perfect. But also when we think about, for example, fuel cells and water splitting for the halogen economy in the future, halogen will also go inside of these small particles of metal that, tend to, that are used to break the water molecule into oxygen and halogen. We still need to understand what halogen does in these systems. So what we have now is a platform, a technique that we can actually deploy onto a range of different materials to understand how halogen affects these materials more specifically. And this is what we're going to do through um, my group and all the groups within the Institute in the foreseeable future.